not heard Alice before. Alice is a master gardener. Um, she is currently the president of the Master Gardener Association here in Callitz County. Um, those have heard her talk. I'm sure that's why you're back on. But those have had her be in for a good time. So, so uh, again, please mute. And uh, with that, Alice, thank you so much for speaking tonight. I'll turn it over to you. Alrighty. Uh, one thing that make your own paper uh, workshop that we're going to have next week is uh, we're selling kits for it, so you can make your own paper. Uh, Gary's got the information. If you would like to buy a kit for six dollars, um, Gary's well, Gary can give you the link. Gary, I'm going to ask you to um, mute from your end. Mute people if you can. I have. Oh, okay. Everybody's good. Alrighty. Okay, the reason I'm asking that is because we're recording and the, the, you know, the feedback is really hard. I'm also going to ask you to hold your questions till the end. You can put them in the chat box, but there'll be plenty of time at the end to, um, to answer them. And I'll probably, I, well, I may, I hope I do, anyhow, answer your questions as I go along. So, before we, uh, we already did that. Um, what we're going to talk about today. Now, Art covered a lot of this in his talk last week, but I'm going to, I'm going to go over it briefly, too, the variety, location, size, some of the problems that we encountered here, and I want you to understand what they're talking about when they say apply pesticide at bud break so that you understand the bud development. Um, and for those of you who just got here, the links to this um, talk and last week's talk are in the chat box. Okay, so we're going to talk about the management of some of the diseases, the more common ones we see in the plant and insect clinic uh, here in western Washington. For site selection, it's pretty much the same as when you're trying to grow any other plant that is trying to fruit. You need at least eight hours of sun. You need a soil pH between six and seven. Your plant can't have wet feet. And you've got to have deep enough soil for the tree roots to expand. Um, the tree spacing, a lot of times you, the, one of the reasons some people can't get fruit on their trees is because they're, they're shade on their trees. And planting your trees far enough apart not only lets you keep your tree unshaded, but it also helps air circulation. So if you have an eight foot tree, you want to plant the tree at least eight feet apart. Soil fertility, I'm not going to go into this too much, but get a soil test at least once. Get a soil test. We have pretty much everything we need in the soil to grow good apples at any rate. Some of the other trees need a little bit more of a boost, but um, the only thing an apple tree might need here probably is boron if, if necessary. But the general rule of thumb is if you're getting... 14 to 16 inches of growth on your tree a year, it doesn't need any more foliage or any more nitrogen. If you add too much nitrogen, you're going to have lush green growth and very poor um, blossom and fruit production. And excess uh, fertilizer or nitrogen also leaves your tree prone to aphids and other uh, insect problems. So keep that in mind. The uh, insects, even the vegetables, they're... The insects really love that lush, succulent growth that lots of nitrogen provides it, provides to it. Site selection. One thing that, you know, I, I guess I never thought about, you want to avoid south-facing slopes. And the reason is, I don't know if you remember last year, we had really, really warm weather. We had a batch of warm weather for about a week, and luckily, I I think that winter, the year before it was like that, we had problems with it. Um, you can get warm weather, say, in April, and it says the, you know, the plants say, I'm going to put forth my blossoms and I'm going to ask some bees to come and pollinate them. And then we get a freeze after they've been pollinated and the uh, blossoms die because they were frozen. If you have it on a south-facing slope, they're liable to warm up sooner. Um, the other thing, don't plant at the bottom of the slope because air is like water. It, it sinks. The cold air sinks. And if you plant at the bottom, those trees are going to be more vulnerable to uh, frost damage. 
And the other thing is you don't want to plant on top of a hilltop either because of the high winds and you can, you know, you can damage the trees that way. So middle of the slope, middle of the road, good place to be. Another thing that you need to watch for, at least for the first few years, you don't want grass growing around your tree. It's, um, it competes with the roots especially some of the dwarf trees that don't have a whole lot of root structure. And it's not only nutrient competition, but in the summertime, it's also uh, water competition. Um, my, my husband, I'll, I'll probably say more about this later, but my husband and I both bought bare root fruit trees three years ago. Three years ago, we planted them. And he put his in the, in the back of the yard and there's grass around it and I said you know you really ought to you know clean the grass around and mulch it no no they'll be fine they'll be fine you should have seen the apples I've had the last two years he's had none he's had two blossoms no apples so he 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 knows better than than I do I guess anyway the one of the best ways to to uh protect from weeds weed, weed competition and to help to moderate soil temperature and moisture is to put mulch around the base of the tree that keep it you get kind of clear space about eight inches around the uh, base of the trunk because it's uh if you get it up to the trunk you're encouraging the formation of roots above the ground and rodents and you don't want that and fungal growth it'll also promote fungal growth Variety selection. I'm not going to go into this a lot, but the one thing that I will say is that if you have, a, have the choice, if, if you don't already have huge trees, get a small, get a dwarf tree or prune a new tree so that it's very small, so, it's, so you don't need a ladder to pick the apples, and there are several reasons for that. For one thing, some of the big trees, I mean, how many apples do you really need? Think about how much you need and how many apples it would, you know, are they going to ripen all at once? What are you going to do with them? You have to plan ahead. But for me, the most important thing is if you don't keep the apple tree at, or any of the fruit trees at a size that you can manage, you'll not be able to properly take care of the uh, pests and diseases that are, uh, that are inevitably going to get you. The other thing you want to do is buy from a local nursery. These folks know, know what grows well here. Burnt Ridge is a place north of us, uh, Sagawa's, Rain Tree. Those people know their stuff. They're, they grow trees, specific, not necessarily specifically for the Pacific Northwest, but places like Burnt Ridge and Rain Tree, they raise them from, in the Pacific Northwest, so they're suited to our areas. Um, the other thing that you want to do is, if possible, buy bare root. Don't, don't get a potted tree and don't get one that's, uh, that's in a burlap bag. People think bare root, oh my gosh, it's going to take forever to, to, you know, to grow. But you know what? It's got 200%, 200% more roots than the same tree that's uh, bald and burlap and then dug and placed into a soil. Um, so... If you have a chance, make sure you try to go with um, bare root. Now, for apples, you want to be careful to choose scab-resistant varieties because we have a real problem with scab in the Pacific Northwest. I have one tree, I have two trees planted together, and one of them is definitely, it's a liberty. It's supposed to be scab-resistant, and I can't remember, Bardsley or something like that is the name of the other one. And it's apparently not scab-resistant, and because it's sitting right next to its neighbor, the Liberty, the Liberty has a little bit of scab, too. I'm going to take care of that, and I'm going to take show you how to take care of it, too. Growing peaches and apricots on our side of the um, Cascades is a very difficult thing to do. Um, they almost always get diseased, mostly because they bloom early when it's still cold, there's frost, all that kind of thing. One thing they, they tell you to do is if you can put it, you know, get a dwarf tree, put it in a pot, and then put it in the garage when it's in dormancy. It doesn't need sunshine. What it doesn't need is rain on it because it will no doubt get some kind of a fungal disease. Peaches will get peach leaf curl, no doubt about it, and I'll tell you how to take care of that. If you're going to get a plum tree, get a European plum 
uh, rather than a Japanese variety because the European plums bloom later, which means that there's a better chance that they won't be damaged by frost. And then we'll talk about cherries later. And do your research. Some trees need a pollinator tree, others don't. But um, like we were talking last week, even, even apple trees at any rate, any tree that says it doesn't need a pollinator, it does better if there's one around. Uh, Chehalis is a good example. Chehalis is self-fruitful, which means it's not supposed to need a pollinator tree. But if you've got a tree close by, it'll do a lot better. Okay, and you'll have these links on, uh, if you um, save those links I have over there on the side, you'll be able to click on the links and see where I got my information from. A lot of good stuff there. Again, smaller the tree, easier it is to prune, take care, keep it safe from pests and diseases, and to harvest. And Art talked a lot about the rootstocks. And these are, these are some of the sizes over here. The mini dwarfs, 5 foot 8, other mini dwarfs, 6 foot 8, and then dwarf gets up to 12 feet. Semi-dwarf is 12 to 16 feet. That's even too high for me. I have, my trees are growing on a semi-dwarf rootstock, and there's a way to keep them small, and that's to do the usual winter pruning and then do a summer pruning, a light summer pruning in summer to keep it small. Art does not agree with that, but uh, a lot of people do it, and it's worked really well for me for the first three years. I have a real good production, and the trees are a reasonable size. And I'll show you how I manage the diseases and insects because my tree is small, but I think that's a little bit later. No, here it is. This is my. These are my two trees. I, you can't see that there are two trees because they are ones behind the other. Um, I've got them planted in the same hole. Uh, the reason I didn't do this because of cobbling moth or apple maggot, I did it because the year before that doggone birds, uh, they would take huge bites out of my apples and then leave the rest. Um, I, I had it covered with netting and the birds, I went outside and I looked and I thought, why are they eating my apples? Because it's covered. And, and I looked and there were two blue jays, two scrub jays came out from underneath they burped politely and said thank you and left. They, they just crawled under. They like the ambiance, I guess. So if you have a small tree, it's a lot easier to um, exclude problems. And I'm not going to go into that. Pollination is important about cross-pollination. Most apples and pears and some of the sweet cherries and plums. The main thing to remember is that the bloom times have to overlap. Um, some are self-fertile, and there are charts out there that show you what is, you know, which ones are the best pollinators, which ones you shouldn't try to pollinate with, such as Gravenstein and John of Gold. So there's um, some choices there. Okay. Mason bees. I'm going to pl put a plug in for uh, Master Gardener Billy's uh, talk. It is February 8th at 6 6 a.m. p.m., huh? i got to fix that. 6 p.m. right here on Zoom, and she's going to tell you how to raise mason bees, and you'll have the opportunity to um, uh, buy a kit with mason bees and the, uh, and the little homes for them. And here is one example of a pollinator uh, chart, but what I really like, now I'm not sure, are, are you able to see this, folks? Yes? Okay. Yep. So what you can do is put in the kind of apple you have, and let me go down to my Liberty. Find pollinator partners, and it will tell you which of the apples are good pollinators for that. And you're going to notice that there are crab apples are uh, listed there as good pollinators. Crab apples are fantastic pollinators for apple trees. One of the most frequent questions we get in the plant and insect clinic is, why didn't my fruit either blossom or why didn't it bear fruit? And first and foremost is tree health. The pest problems involving insects, if not detected early and properly, can influence the uh, tree's production. 
And if they're not taken care of, if they're not watered, if they're not uh, during the irrigated during the summer and in their first couple of years, um, if they are crowded in there, if they're shaded, all of these things affect their tree health or the health of the tree. Now, the bearing age is something that a lot of people uh, are concerned about. And for all I know, the kind of trees that my husband has there in the backyard, they may be the kind that just need another couple years to be ready to grow. When you purchase um, nursery growing fruit trees, the tops that you see will be about two years old. And the length of time from planting to fruit bearing depends on the type of fruit. So apples can take two to five years. Um, apricots, peaches, two to four, two to five. Pears, four to six. Plums, three to six. Ch sweet cherries, four to seven. So it, it varies. If you've got a young tree and it hasn't done anything, it could be that it's just a baby yet. Fruiting habits. Um, that, boy, there's a lot to say about that. If, I hope that you folks are thinning your fruit. Most fruit, when it first, when it comes out, it's on spurs, and you've got lots and lots and lots of blossoms on that. One spur that comes out, it looks like a baby bouquet. What you need to do is keep an eye on those things, and when you've got the king flower, the one, one that's um, going to be the big guy, then you can either... You can wait until the uh, fruit starts to form, and it's about the size of a, oh, about the size of your thumb, you know, the tip of your thumb. Or you can actually start by pruning off those blossoms. If you don't do that, um, it's going to rob the tree of being able to good, have adequate bud formation for the next year. Not to mention the fact that if you have too many, um, too many apples on one, in one cluster, it it's an invitation for cobbling moth and other problems. And uh, if you don't thin your tree, the tree will drop. June drop, it'll drop a bunch of moth, and they'll, it'll try to thin itself anyway. But you should help it. And um, just remember, and the other thing is, if you've had a problem with a tree that blooms, that gives you fruit one year, and the next year you don't have any fruit, and then the next year you have fruit, and the next year you don't have any fruit. That's because it probably overproduced one year, didn't set the buds, and now it's not going to be able to have fruit the next year. And it makes it really difficult to stop that um, swing, swinging back and forth. Um, it's called biennial bearing. To help reduce that, you should thin the fruit, usually, well, no later than... Uh, when the fruits are about the size of a large marble. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's go on to cultural practices. And again, that kind of goes along with tree health, water, fertility, if you do need it, and reducing competition, good pruning practices, which aren't covered last year. Sometimes over pruning is a problem, or poor pruning can be a problem while you don't have uh, have bearing, fruit bearing. I think the one thing that matters most here is our climate. La and last year, year before last, um, we had a lot of problems with people saying, you know, I didn't get cherries this year, I didn't get plums this year. M apples were pretty much okay, but all these different fruit trees that blossom a little bit earlier, they got frost hurt, frost um, damage, and they produced no fruit or very little fruit. And there's the only thing that you can do, if you have a small tree, again, you're at an advantage, is try to cover it with a blanket. I've heard people say, well, if you can spray it, and that'll help to protect it like they do in Florida. But that's, that's really iffy because you have to make sure that it's not real low humidity outside and that it's not windy. Because if you try to spray your plant to protect it from frost under those conditions, you make it worse. Um, Let's see, pollination, we talked about that. And part of the problem that goes in with climate is the, a lot of these fruit trees pollinate very early and there aren't any pollinators out, which is why we would like to have mason bees out there. Um, mason bees are very early pollinators. They are very, very busy. And um, they'll, they'll be able to pollinate your trees before the other bees come out. 
So really consider raising uh, mason bees and come to Billy's talk on, what did I say that was, on, on the 3rd of February to learn about it. Okay, we talked about variety selection. This is the boring but important. Um, there's a concept called the, the disease triangle. And three factors happen to be, have to be in effect at the same time for disease to occur. You have to have a susceptible host, like an apple tree. You have to have a bad pathogen, uh, let's say apple scab. And you have to have the suitable environment for it. Here in the Pacific Northwest, it's unfortunate, but we have the most conducive environment for fungal diseases here because it's wet and cold, and a whole lot of fungal diseases really like that. Folks, please mute your mics. Um, we obviously have susceptible hosts, and what the whole point is is to try to disrupt one of these because you can't have disease when you're missing one. So. Part of what we're going to talk today about is IPM, which is um, integrated pest management. We're not just going to go out and spray something because that's not going to take care of the problem. We need to interrupt this process somehow. So with IPM, we take a look at it. And we identify, monitor the problem. We'll be talking about that later, say, with calling moths. Find out what the problem is and start watching for it. And there are different ways to monitor it. And once you get the results from the monitoring, say you find a whole bunch of uh, male coddling moths on your sticky trap, how much damage is that pest actually going to cause? Are you able to tolerate a little bit of damage? Sometimes you have to control it because it's a good neighbor will control it so it doesn't uh, spread to somebody else's tree. Then you find ways to prevent it. And we always look at the uh, to least toxic methods, the least invasive methods first. In this case, they put a band around the tree to stop coddling moth, um, pupae, from um, living on the tree and will climbing up into the apples. So that's the first step you take. And after that, you look at the different other different ways. You have a healthy tree, you make sure that um, a lot of different things. You can monitor it, and you, you, it starts all over again. The, the four, number four is the action plan, and that's where pesticide use comes in. And once we start talking about pesticide use, we want to make sure that we are using the least toxic uh, pesticides first, and we will help you with that. Most of the pesticides that I'm going to be talking about today are very effective and um, a lot of them are formulated for organic. That doesn't mean they're not, they're, they're still, they still need to be um, applied with great care. You need to read the label, read the directions, because we're trying really hard to protect the pollinators. Most of the um, insecticides we'll be talking about tonight need to be applied late in the day, at dusk, after the bees and other pollinators have gone to bed. By morning, most of these are pretty harmless to the pollinators, but um, not so to the, the target pest. The other reason we really try to limit the use of pesticides and try these other preventive methods first is one of your best defenses against insect damage is the beneficial insects in your garden. They really do a good job in controlling the pests. Um, one way <laughs> to invite the beneficial pests to your garden is to have beneficial insects to your garden is to have a few pests. Um, I, I intentionally let a few aphids start on my tomato plants if I find them. And man, I'll tell you, by the end of the week, I've got ladybugs and, and lace wings and all kinds of good little guys coming in to take care of the buffet. <clears throat> so, we're going to get into the problems that you can see with trees. Uh, a broken branch can often be fixed. It, um, this tree obviously has much too sharp an angle. It, it's an it's a accident waiting to happen, but you can help to uh, shore it up and to prevent any further damage by propping it like this. Um, we talked about June drop, and we talked about thinning fruit. 
and again, have the branches being pulled down on your tree, it's going to kill you to thin this fruit. You look at this and you think, oh, geez, I can't take this off. Look at it. It's beautiful. You got to. It's for the health of the tree. You'll get bigger fruit, happier fruit, and you'll have a lot of fruit next year, too. So just keep that in mind. We're going to be talking a lot about disease and that kind of thing, but I want to talk about growing cherries in western Washington. Don't, especially sweet cherries. Um, they've got so many problems here, mostly because they, especially the sweet cherries, they crack. And they are very uh, sensitive to bacterial canker. It's a bad disease. We have, let, let the people on the, west, on the east side of the uh, Cascades grow them. They do a good job. They've got the weather for it. We really don't. And then birds will get them, and then there's spotted wing drosophila, which is very difficult to manage in a tree. It's a little easier to manage on raspberries and blackberries and strawberries, but in a tree, it's not. And if you, as plums too, plums are really, really sensitive, to, uh, susceptible to that. So don't grow cherries if, if you have the choice. Plums, Japanese plums are susceptible to damage, so get one of the European prune plums like, like this. They will do a lot better. And aphids are very common on those, so you just apply a dormant spray for them before, um, it's just to control the aphids. One thing we see a lot of here and it's something that I wasn't familiar with back in Ohio, probably because we all had these closed-in yards. Trees that are exposed, on the, usually on the south side of the tree, to bright sunshine and then cold nights often end up with split trunks. If you have ever had that problem and you don't see any other problem on the tree, any other kind of disease, there is a good chance that it's because of the temperature difference. One of the ways that you can uh, take care of that is use one of those uh, wraps specifically designed for trees, a, <clears throat> a plastic tree wrap, or you can use a 50-50 dilution of interior latex white paint and whitewash it. That'll reflect the light instead of absorbing the heat into the uh, tree. Here's some of the problems we see on stone fruits, and we'll cover those one by one. The bacterial canker, Brown rock, boy, we saw a lot of that last year. Spotted wing drosophila, the little fruit fly, and the winter injury, that's the gummosis, the winter injury that we're talking about there with the whitewash. So bacterial canker can affect all stone fruits, stone fruits being things with the stones in them like cherries, plums, uh, apricots, and peaches. But it's really, um, really more common on plums and cherries. It's a bacterial disease and it's spread by wind and rain and insects, the usual thing, and infected nursery stock, as well as your neighbor's uh, infected tree or other trees in your yard that are infected. What happens is you get these, um, uh, sometimes the leaves and the fruit fall off but the big thing is that the leaf and fruit spots aren't that common. And it's the cankered areas, the wounds on the uh, bark that are the most notice noticeable. The infected tissues might produce this gum. And you'll often see cankers, which are, this is a canker. And you can see the, the darkened areas here that will produce a wound, a canker. Um, the... Uh, the trees don't do well, and it'll kill a cherry tree. So what can you do about it? You can plant resistant varieties. And like I said, don't plant the old and new uh, trees together. And prune when the weather is dry. Don't try to prune or fix it or do anything when it's wet out because that'll just uh, contribute to the spread of disease. And as a matter of fact, just general pruning, if, if your tree needs it, should not be done in the spring because of that. Even if it's uninfected, do it in the summertime. So you want to cut out the cankers, which are, again, these wounds. And you can see if you cut away the bark here, this won't kill the tree. If you cut away the bark here, you can see the infected tissues and you can see healthy tissue. 
what you want to do is cut it away so that you've got a nice margin of healthy tissue and then cut this part out. Leave it uncovered to dry. Don't try to paint it with anything because that'll just that's like putting a Band-Aid on the wound that doesn't have, you know, that that is still infected. It's not going to do any good. So let it let it cure itself in the air. They were just starting this. They didn't finish it. If it were done, you would see a nice oval-shaped area with nice healthy tissue here. There's very little that you can do to treat it. Some, some people talk about using a copper-based fungicide in October and again in January, but that hasn't been shown to work well and it will not work at all if you don't get rid of the uh, cankers. And this is a, one that we've seen a lot of. We usually see it at the plant and insect clinic when the um, plant looks like this. And I know this looks a lot like this, but bacterial canker is not primarily a uh, disease of the leaves and flowers. It's mostly of the of the wood tissues. But you'll see something like this and eventually it's going to get all fuzzy with the, uh, the fungal spore. And if it gets on the fruit, you're going to see a concentric uh, wound with the little fungal spores on it. Sometimes the, the uh, wood itself will get some elongated cankers with a little bit of gumming, but nothing like you would see with the um, bacterial infection. Um, the first thing you see, well, the, the infected flowers are going to wilt and die, and it's going to infect the fruit even at uh, pre-harvest. You can remove the infected fruits and blossoms as soon as you see them and cut it back to healthy tissue and get all, it'll turn into some of the fruit that's left on the trees will turn into mummified little, little pellets. Get those off the tree as soon as you see them. Um, you'll want to take care of the cankers if you see them. Um, chances are you're going to want to prune those out, off because they're not going to be on the trunk or, or on large branch, chances are, just on the twigs. So we just prune them out as soon as you see them in the summer. Don't wait until the dormant season because then you're not going to be able to, it's not going to have all those, those fuzzy spores on it. So do it in the uh, summer when you can actually see where it's diseased. You're going to be using this is a real, these two are really good uh, fungicides for this disease. It's my, uh, mycobutanil, called, and I think the one, I think there's only one brand or one product that uh, uses it. It's called Immunox. There may be others out there now, but look for mycobutanil and then a sulfur-based um, fungicide. And you're going to want to spray it before the blossoms open, which makes sense, right? You want to stop the fungus from expressing itself. And then when it's at full bloom, and then again when most of the petals have fallen off. That way you'll take care of it, from, take care of the chances of it um, proliferating. Aren't you glad you're going to have access to this later so that you don't have to take a million notes? Okay. This guy, the spotted wing drosophila, is a, is a really bad one. It wasn't here 10 years ago. It's here now, and it's to stay. It's one of those vinegar fly relatives, you know, the ones that go, go around your uh, tomatoes after you pick them and are just really annoying, and that you can catch in a, a jar of vinegar and a glass of wine. But these are, these are worse because they attack healthy fruit, and they will get any soft-skinned fruit. Um, I've had it on my... Um, blackberries on my strawberries. I've had it on raspberries and a lot of people come in with it on their plums. And since we don't have that many people growing cherries here, but you could have it in cherries too. Um, a friend of mine was telling me about it. He, one of the problems we have is we have so many blackberries here and blackberries get ripe and nobody picks them, right? Because they're weeds. And the spotted wing drosophila love those. And so they're everywhere. They're just everywhere. And his wife went out first year they moved up here and picked out a whole bunch of beautiful ripe blackberries and brought them in the kitchen. She was going to clean them up and make jelly. She came back and into the kitchen a couple hours later, and they were just crawling with these little maggots. Can you see it right there? It was, they're all over. One thing you can do, like with strawberries and uh, 
you know, that the smaller fruit, if you get a small amount of them, say a cup out of a whole bunch that you've collected, and put them in a, a salt water solution and count how many float to the top, you'll have an idea if your fruit's infested. And if you don't have a problem with it, then, then you're good to go. But if, you, if there's a million of them, then chances are the entire batch is infested. So what happens is the adults, the, the male has little spots on its wings. The female doesn't. That's how you know it's the spotted wing drosophila, the one that you're trying to get rid of. But the female has an ovipositor, which looks kind of like a stinger, and she lays the eggs inside the fruit. And then the eggs hatch, and you get these little maggots, like so. And um, they, they ruin the fruit. They destroy the fruit. Alice. Yes. A question. Yes. When is the best time to prune cherry trees to prevent disease? Any time that you... To prevent disease, I wouldn't if you... To prevent... Oh, I just lost... Can you folks hear me? We can. Yes. Oh, it just said it turned my uh, speaker off. Um, in the summertime is the best time to prune cherry trees, but you don't always have to. If, if there is a problem with the tree, you can prune off dead branches and diseased branches whenever you see them. But as far as doing the, uh, you know, the disease, cutting out the disease, the cankers, like we said, do that when it's, when it's dry. If you can have a stretch of dry weather, that's the best time to do it. Art, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, you got it right on, you nailed it right on that head on that just in the summertime I usually prune after the fruit is bared and then also in the wintertime I start watching while there's no leaves on the tree just to mark the branches and then prune them in the summer. Thank you. Okay, um, how do you take care of this? You want to monitor for it and this works really, really well. This is a, um, here's the directions for it, but they're just using one of those plastic drink cups with the lid, and they have used a, a, a nail that's heated and poked holes in it, and they put a little bit of cider, apple cider vinegar in it and a couple drops of laundry detergent, which, not laundry detergent, uh, dish detergent, which acts as a surfactant, and once they're in there, they can't escape. And keep an eye on it. Open it up every few days and pour it onto a white surface to get your magnifying glass out and see if you see any of the male spotted wing drosophilus. They are the ones, like I said, with the little spots on them. There are a lot of different flies out there, a lot of different fruit flies out there, but they are the only ones with the little black spots. And that will let you know if, if you need to start controlling them. But something you can do right away, and again, a small tree helps you with this too. If you see any damaged fruit, pull it off the tree. If you have anything on the, if anything's fallen on the ground, get it up off the ground. And once the fruits do start to ripen, pick them when it's time. If you let them get too ripe on the tree, that's an invitation. And you um, don't want to compost it. You want to dispose of it in a sealed container. You, you can either throw it in the garbage in a sealed container or you can put the, um, the fruit in a black or clear plastic bag and leave it in the sunshine for a week. And that should, the, the heat in that should probably kill it. You, I wouldn't trust a compost pile. And the pesticides are only effective on adults. If, it ha if you already have an infestation, it's not going to help. So that's why you need to monitor. And if you're going to spray, the fruit that you're spraying must be listed on the label. So did I, okay, um, you have to thoroughly spray it, the fruit and the foliage, and you might have to use a lot of different um, applications, and you don't want to be using the same pesticide. Um, my, you can, uh, you apply it in the evening, like I said, to protect the pollinators, but you want to, especially since it's a, a soft bodied fruit, you want to use the least, least toxic choices, and that would be spinosad and pyrethrins. Most of those are organic, and they don't last long, which 
which is why you may have to put them on more frequently, but their effects won't last long in the fruit either. Um, the more toxic ones are malathion and espen valerate, and they are more toxic to the uh, to the pollinators, but they do last longer. But the other thing they're toxic to are the beneficials. So again, prevention is the way to go. Get out there, pick your fruit. Um, don't let anything be on the ground. If you find something that is infested, get rid of it and monitor for the spotted winter sophua. Okay, growing peaches and nectarines in the Pacific Northwest. Don't grow nectarines and growing peaches is very difficult here. Now, I know some of you do grow peaches and you've had a lot of success, but um, we work in the plant and insect clinic and all we hear are the heartaches of these beautiful peach trees that are just devastated every single spring. Um, the only ones that do well here are the genetic dwarfs. And like I said before, you can grow them in your yard, but if you really want to make sure that they don't get a disease, grow them in a pot or cover them in plastic and put them in your, or you, or you can leave them outside or you can put them in the garage. They're not, you know, uh, not a heated garage, but just a garage so that they're out of the rain. They'll do a lot better, and it'll protect them from um, frost, too, once they start opening. This is the main problem that we see. One of the main problems is peach leaf curl. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's quite distinctive. And the problem with that is you can't treat it when you see it. It's got to, it's got to happen in January, but we'll get into that. Perineum blight is another one we see a lot of, and that brown rot that we talked about on the cherry trees is another big problem. And ne nectarines are even worse. I wouldn't even bother trying to grow them. So it's, peach leaf curl is a fungal disease. It's, it goes on the leaves and twigs, but where you mostly see it is on the, uh, the leaves. And it overwinters in the buds, and it's a big problem here. It can cause defoliation of the tree, and when that happens, it reduces the vigor because it's not photosynthesizing, and, and of course, it re increases susceptibility to every problem that there is. If you can plant resistant uh, varieties, that helps. Um, most of the people that have brought their trees to us, their problems to us, have frost or frost king, and they've got peach leaf curl. It just, it's that we don't have the best place to do that and the best place to grow these. But what you want to do while it's in bloom or, you know, while the tree is actively growing is remove and destroy any infected leaves as you see them. Starting in January, first week of January, apply a copper ammonia fungicide, and here's an example of it, and then every three weeks, every three weeks until the uh, weather is warm and dry. Otherwise, you know, if you had it last year, or your tree was infected last year, and you're not doing this, there's a chance that it'll happen again as uh, the tree starts growing in the springtime. Somebody asked, does thinning fruit apply to pears as well as apples? Yes, it does, and it applies to um, other fruit, all the other fruits as well. Okay, walnut husk fly, I really haven't seen many people coming that, that grow walnuts in our area, but it is a problem for people who do grow, try to grow them. It usually, uh, it's later in the season, in um, July, that you start seeing it. It's the size of a house fly. It's got these stripes on it. They all kind of look alike, but each one is, each one is pretty specific to the kind of tree that it affects. But this is what it looks like inside the, the walnut husk. It just ruins it, and it turns black on the outside. That's usually how you know you have it. So what do you do about it? You want to remove the infested fruit. Like I said, it's black, blackened. You'll, you'll take it out, and in early July, start with these sticky traps. You can make your own by using, uh, what's it called, tanglefoot or some kind of sticky stuff, or you can just buy a package of, I think I bought a package of 30 of these for, I don't know, under $10. And they are super sticky. I bought them for fungus snacks, but they're useful for a lot of different things. But in early July, hang these sticky traps about six feet above the um, ground in a shady part of the tree. And as soon as you catch the, the husk flies, you, you want to start um, spraying. Neem oil is a good one. 
it's organic. And spinosad is another one that has organic formulations. You might have to apply them very frequently every 10 days and make sure that you use it at dusk so that you're protecting the bees and other pollinators. But July to mid-August is very critical if you want to control this. We don't see a lot of this either. This is scale. Now, these don't look like insects, do they? They look like little hard. I mean, look at that. That doesn't look like there's insects there. And unless you really looked hard here, you wouldn't think of any, think it was anything. These are hard scale insects that are related to aphids. They, um, they, they hatch from eggs. And there's a very young stage called crawlers. And if you look at these yellow things here, those are the crawling stage. It's the only time you can actually can try to control this. Um, once these scale insects get to where they want to live, they stop. They just grow there for the rest of their lives. And the only way to stop it is to watch them and to get them at the right time. So in, um, if you see them, you can actually rub them off with your finger. I mean, they're, they're insects. You can just scrape them off with your finger. Or if they're not on the main trunk of the tree, you can uh, prune, prune out the affected wood if it's not too much. In late April, start to monitor for those crawlers by using a double sticky sided tape on your tree. You'll see them if they get caught. Tangled wood is a good uh, adhesive, and there are some other ones too. Um, you can apply oil to the overwintering stage. If you see these in the wintertime, you can apply um, a, 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 horticultural oil just before the bud starts to grow in the spring. Not when it when it's opened up, but when it goes from dormant to when it's, the bud starts to get a little bit fat before it opens up into leaves. That's the time to apply the, um, the horticultural oil. And there is a typo. Mid-June to July, 10 days after full petal fall, then you can use neem oil and a spinosad product to control for it. That's when the uh, crawlers are out, and you will, you'll get the crawlers. This is my apple tree that I was telling you about, the bird's bottom. I was just so upset. And, you know, when you have a, a wound like that in an apple, you just in, in fight all kinds of other problems. So I picked the apples, got rid of them. They were too young. They, were, they weren't ripe enough to eat, even though they're red. So um, I lost about two-thirds of the apples on my tree that year, and that was the first year they bore. Uh, so here are some of the primary problems we have with apples, and a lot of times pears too. Anthracnose, apple scab, rust, pear leaf blister mite is really common, but not terribly serious. Codling moth is nasty, as is apple magnet, maggot, and we have uh, brown marmorated stink bug. Um, in past years, we've had 10 caterpillars, but it hasn't been too much of a problem in the past, oh, I'd say, three years. The uh, population seems to burgeon, gets really, really bad everywhere you look. There are 10 caterpillars, and then they disappear because <laughs> all the beneficial insects have been attracted by the sheer numbers of them. It, it gets the numbers down, and then eventually the whole cycle starts again in a few years. Almost every apple tree in Washington, if it's been out there long enough, has anthracnose. And part of that is because people aren't controlling it on their, in their yards, in their home orchards, because they don't know about it. You'll frequently see tree branches that look like this, and they will have strips of bark. It almost looks like fiddle sticks, fiddle strings over the cankers. And that's kind of the late stage of this fungal disease. Early on, it looks like this, kind of like a bruise on the, uh, on the wood. In the, uh, it can also affect the fruit, and it looks like this. It's called bullseye rot, and you can see why, because you've got the center that's lighter, and then it goes concentrically out in um, the darker color. Uh, the infection starts in the fall, but the symptoms don't start until the spring. So guess when you're going to be starting to take care of it? And the problem is it, it really, really travels. Uh, it, like I said, I, I, if you go out and look in people's yards, I'll bet you'll find apple anthracnose, maybe even in your own yard. 
So again, what we're going to tell you to do is try to plant resistant cultivars. And that this is one disease that if you look up the apple tree that you want to buy, or if you have one, go look your apple tree up and see if it's scab or if, if it's uh, anthracnose resistant. You'll want to prune the infected wood as soon as you see it. Uh, the, uh, prune the branch. You don't want to be doing anything with the uh, a canker what we saw. But in the fall, before the rains start, you want to make a canoe-shaped cut around the canker so that it's kind of an elongated oval. I, I, I don't know if you can see. I can't see myself on the screen. But, um, and you want to prune to healthy tissue like we looked at, at the, um, oh, the bacterial blight on the uh, cherry tree. You want to leave it healthy margins. And you always want to sterilize with uh, Lysol or alcohol or um, a 10% bleach solution between cuts. Destroy the infected wood and some trees that it's all over the place, you know, if it's everywhere, get rid of it because it's spreading the disease not only in your, in your property but to other people's too. What you can do now, copper-based fungicides work fairly well if you, to, to prevent problems with the fruit. If you spray when the, most of the pebbles are off the tree and at two-week intervals, it will help. If you know you've got anthracnose, if you've seen the evidence of it to prevent your fruit from being damaged, you can spray at petal fall and then every two weeks until uh, about two weeks beforehand to help protect the fruit. And then before the fall rains start and again about a month later, um, spray again. That should help control it for the next season. But unless you cut the cankers out, those fungicides won't work. Animal damage. This came from, this picture came from a master gardener's uh, apple trees. He says, what, what happened? Do I have a disease? Nope. You got bunnies. This, I, I couldn't see it well enough, but it looks like bunny damage. Uh, the voles don't usually come up that high. Um, what you want to do is try not to have this kind of stuff underneath the tree and you can protect the tree chunks with this tree wrap. The other thing you can do is get uh, chicken wire and put it around the base of the tree, but you want to bury the chicken wire about four to six inches down into the soil to keep bowls out too. Apple scab is very common here. I'll bet you've seen this in apples in the store sometimes. A lot of times they'll sell them if it's not too bad. And there's nothing wrong with it. If It usually is only a surface lesion, so you can eat it. I always get this question. Yeah, you can eat it, or if it offends you, you can peel it off. But um, this is obviously much more desirable. But it starts on the leaves, and it's an olive green color lesion on the apple leaf. It's a fungal disease. Um, it gets on the buds and blossoms, and it eventually ends up with scabs on the fruit. The first place I saw it was on the leaves of my apple tree last year, on my Bardsey apple, and then I saw a couple of little spots on the fruit, and I need to get out there really soon and start taking care of it. Um, the fungus overwinters on dead apples or uh, leaves on the ground, so that it's very, very important that you get those up off the ground in the, in the fall. You can shred the leaves. It's probably, you know, if you shred the leaves, it decreases the infection rates by 85 to 95%. And the other thing is, if, if you've got like a huge area and you just can't rake it up, if you shred them, it'll, it'll decrease it. And then in the, in the spring, if you do it again, it will be almost, you'll almost eradicate it. Um, you can compost it if it's shredded because, like I said, the disease burden is, is not very much. You'll want to uh, apply protective fungicides at um, bud break when the little bitty green leaves are starting to open. I've got some photos later that show you what these different stages are. And you want to keep continuing all summer long, or at least until a month after petal fall. So that would be... Uh, just after the little fruits are starting to form. And copper, sulfur, and uh, again, microbutanol and potassium bicarbonate are, are some choices. I think the first three have um, organic formulations. I don't think immunox is. In high scab areas, you want to spray even resistant trees. 
because like I said, my liberty is supposed to be resistant, but just because it's resistant doesn't mean that it's immune. So rust diseases are actually very fascinating. Not if it's on your tree, but it's really fascinating. It takes two trees. It takes a host tree and it takes the one of the, um, the cedar or juniper to cause the disease. Um, if you interrupt either one of these, the disease will go away. They need, both need to be there. So early in the season, you can have Pacific Coast pear rust, and it's the incense cedar that it is a, an alternate host with. And this is what it looks like on your pear. We see a lot of this on the, on the, peach, on the pear leaves. Uh, I haven't, nobody's ever brought in the, the pears, but this is what they'll look like. It infects the leaves and, and the pears. Now, late in the summer, there's pear trellis rust, and it's an alternate host is juniper. And you'll see little acorn-like structures on the backs of the leaves, and you'll see this on the top of the leaves. And that happens in late summer, but they're both rust diseases. And unfortunately, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. Um, sanitation, again, picking up leaves, um, getting rid of infected fruit. Try to plant resistant varieties, and if you try to find resistant varieties, I looked all over the place. The only thing I could find is that Asian and European um, varieties are affected. Barton, it's usually a little bit better, and winter nellis is the worst. But it's really hard to find any listings for resistant varieties, even though they say plant resistant varieties. The pear trellis rust, they tell you to remove all junipers within a thousand feet and the spores from the incense cedar, <laughs> they can be blown around for six to ten miles. So we're not talking your yard, we're talking about your neighbor's yard, we're talking about some tree that you didn't even know is out in, in a, a field next to you. It's very, very hard to control. Um, luckily, there's, I, I haven't seen anything destroyed by it, but there's really no, um, there's no pesticide for it, no fungicide that is actually anywhere near um, effective. Now we see a lot of pear leaf blister mite too. These are caused by little teeny tiny areophyid mites and they lay their eggs inside the leaves, underneath the leaves, and they start to grow in there and the little uh, insect starts eating off the tissue and it causes a lot of damage in the uh, leaves. And this is early in the season. Later in the season, if you have pear trees and you had trouble with them, this is all brown. And, the, the, and it's usually speckled like that. And you usually see it running like this, like railroad tracks, right along the um, main vein here. You see how that, that's kind of, you know, grad, gradually from the inside to the outside, it's much more um, apparent there. They become active at bud break. And bud break, again, isn't flowers. Bud break is when the little leaves come out of the buds. And they infest in the bud scales over winter. So if you want to get rid of them, you've got to uh, start early. Um, what you do for it, remove the infested leaves. And a lot of most of the times it doesn't really damage the tree if it's because it, the uh, blister mites don't travel far. Usually it's only one branch of the tree, and if you can, if it's not going to hurt the tree too much or aesthetically, you know, ruin its looks, prune the branch off and you're probably taking care of the problem. You can apply dormant oils just before bud swell, uh, just before those little buds go from completely dormant to when they start to enlarge a little bit. That's a good time to apply the uh, dormant oils, such as the ones listed here. This is a big problem. I think I saw, this is from my own apple tree, actually. No, it was, I'm sorry, it wasn't from my apple tree. It was from a friend's apple tree. Uh, he said, yeah, go ahead and pick my apples. I'm not going to use them this year. So I went and picked a bunch of them. And, and he said, don't worry about those little spots. That's nothing. And I knew what it was, but I thought, well, I'll cut the parts away. Well, I cut into it. We are making um, applesauce. Then I actually use the unaffected part of the apple. But as I cut into it, and there he is. And what they do is um, they burrow as tiny little um, maggots all the way down to the seed center. And as they eat their way out again, there's usually frass on the outside. Frass is insect poop. 
And sometimes you can't tell that the tree has been invaded because it goes in here. No, I'm sorry, in here through the blossom end. And you won't see it until you cut the apple open. Now what they do after they have um, eaten their way out, they, they exit the fruit, and then they go down and they burrow, usually, in, if it's an older apple tree anyway, in the bark. They find a place to hide in the bark that's, you know, safe and warm and it's sheltered. Um, or they sometimes they'll go to a nearby structure and, you know, and pupate there. And there are some things you can take advantage of with that situation. Unfortunately, in our area, we have two generations. I don't think we have three generations of bees. So just because you take care of the problem early in the season doesn't mean you're not going to have a second chance for problems. Oops. First thing we're going to try is mechanical control because that's the least toxic options and we don't have to use chemicals if this works. This is just a simple uh, piece of corrugated cardboard right there. And the uh, larvae really like those little corrugations. They'll go right inside there, and it's much easier to get into than the bark, and it's really protected. And they'll, if you put them in there, uh, if you put them there in early May, as they, um, you know, as, as the, the first, the first, um, when I'll split it out, the, um, the first ones get laid, and then they go down here, they, they pupate, and they, they may stay there. And when you get them out, you put them there in early May, and you remove this in late June, and make sure you destroy it. Because if you don't, you've just made it easier for them. With the second generation, you put the new strip in mid-July, and then you leave it on it until harvest time, past harvest. Hmm. I'll be darned. Okay. The other thing you can do that doesn't require pesticides is bag your fruit. This is really energy intensive. There are different things you can use. If you have a small tree, it's a lot easier. You can use these fancy, expensive Japanese bags. They're not terribly expensive. I think it costs like $20 per hundred of them. Um, you wrap them around the apple when they're at just after you thin them, and you've got that one little fruit per cluster, and it's about the size of your thumb. Um, the uh, the other thing you can use, well, you leave them on all summer, and that will protect it not only from cobbling moth, but from apple maggot. And about three weeks before it's time to harvest, you want to remove it so it'll get a little bit of um, summer sun. It's absolutely essential that you pick up and destroy infested fruit. Don't let it sit on the ground, because if you do, they're going to go, the, um, the they will pupate in the soil and climb right up your trees again. That's what happened to my friend's trees. He was sick one summer and didn't take care of it like he, was, he should have, and the next year they were just loaded. The other reason that you want to thin fruit is if the um, apples are touching, if you've left more than one apple on a cluster, it's a, for some reason it's a really, really good place for the, um, for the coddling moth maggot to go, not maggot, caterpillar to go. So the chemical approach, the eggs hatch three weeks after the adults begin to fly. So how do we know when the bugs, when they, the adults start to fly? Um, they, they, you want to spray when the eggs are hatching, and if, they're, if you um, are at all familiar with growing degree days, it's a certain amount of heat accumulation, and that's how we know that it's a, it's a precise thing, too. That's the biofix state. That's when we know that we're going to see the, uh, the flying adults. However, you don't really have to use that. If you start in early May and start watching for it, you can do it this way, too. Get one of these Delta traps. It's got a sticky pad inside. It's got a little pheromone vial in there, and it attracts the male coddling moth. And once you have several, I think, they, I can't remember how many they said, like seven calling moths, that means that that's sustained flight. You've got a lot of calling moths out there. Then that means that they're laying eggs, and so two weeks after you get that many on your sticky pad, 
that's when you want to start spraying. The other thing that you can do if you're not going to monitor, although I strongly suggest that you monitor and do it that way because you can be very precise, about 10 days after all the petals fall off, that's, or, or 17, I would say the petals fall off because that's more precise than 17 to 21 days after full bloom. That's when you want to spray. And some of the uh, organic choices you, that you can use are spinosad, um, <sighs> BT, somebody's got their mic off, um, neem oil, and some of the pyrethrins. Make sure that you follow all the directions, and I think all of these are supposed to be applied at dusk to protect the pollinators. So what we're talking about now is coddling moth um, care has to start in May. They're the first big bad ones out. They're the ones that cause just usually one or two long tunneling holes. This is an apple maggot, and it railroads through the apples. We had a lot of these last year, and that one started showing up, I think, about five years ago. Um, the outside of the apple will look like it's got all kinds of little dimples on it. What happens is the female stings the outside of the fruit and lays an egg, and it heals with a little bit of a dimple. And the female can, just like hundreds of eggs, and the larvae just tunnel and tunnel and tunnel. You can see part of a, one of the little uh, maggots here, and you can see it there too, but a lot of times they're too small for you to even see. These apples are not usable. That fruit is destroyed. You need to um, make sure that you get these apples up if they fall to the ground because the larvae pupate or go into their next stage, the resting stage, in the soil. And they winter underground or, you know, winter underground in the winter. And in the summertime, that's when they hatch and the whole thing starts over again. So you've got you've to keep on that too. And I, I think... We are in the apple maggot quarantine area because we are prone to um, getting apple maggot. Oh, that I should have watched and seen that. Um, we are not permitted to carry apples from our side over to the east side because right now I didn't notice that. They've got it over in two different counties there. We've got to protect the apple um, growers on the east side of the Cascades. It's a, it's a really, that would just devastate them. So how do you take care of it? There are no pheromone traps for um, apple maggots, or yeah, for apple maggots. What you use is you can buy these red spheres and cover it with tangle foot, a sticky substance, or you can buy them like that. But I saw an even better solution, and I, I, I saw somebody try it last year, and it worked really well. With these apple maggot traps, you have to uh, every so often clean off the surface of it with mineral spirits and then reapply, you know, with, with all those dead animals, with all those dead insects on it. And then you have to reapply the um, sticky stuff. Get a nice, big, red, delicious apple, big, pretty red apple, and coat it with the um, sticky stuff, with that tangle foot, and hang it up in the tree. And then when, it, when it's covered with uh, the apple maggots, throw it away. That's not going to control your problem. That helps you to monitor how many you've got, though. That, that's the problem with this and that apple maggots. That, that's all, the traps are only for monitoring. So, again, you'll want to bag the fruit early in the spring if that's what you choose to do, and then remove it three weeks before harvest. Again, that's really energy intensive, and for most people it's just really not, not an easy thing to do. But make sure that you are looking at the tree to see if you have any obvious fruit that has that dimple stuff on the outside. Get it off your tree. Again, clean up any fruit that's on the ground and don't compost it. And this is another one of those things that you want to put it in a clear or black garbage bag and secure it tightly and stick it in the sun for a week because the heat will destroy that. And then throw it in the, uh, the trash. The... Uh, there's an ammonia lure that you can also hang with the apple, sticky apple trap, and it helps to draw them, although just the sticky apple will work too. So if you, if you are in, end up having to use chemical management, pesticides should be applied in early July with repeat applications every week or two until right before harvest. Then you want to check what the, uh, 
what the label says. Um, they tell you to stop. I can't remember what it's called. They tell you to stop uh, using this, be, you know, X amount of days or X amount of weeks before harvest. The problem with the uh, two choices that WSU gives homeowners, uh, acetamiprid and esfenvalerate, they are both extremely toxic to um, pollinators. And I really don't like using them. But apple maggot is one of those that um, it's really the only thing that works. So if you can possibly protect your tree in these other methods we've been talking about, you're much better off. These other two also kill um, an awful lot of the beneficial insects. So, you know, use with caution, follow the directions, don't overuse it, and protect the pollinators if you can. So again, coddling moths, start, uh, care starts in May, apple maggots starts in July. And a lot of times the, you know, the, the spring for them overlaps and it will take care of both problems. My son swears that just by using spinosad that he's able to control both apple maggot and coddling moth, although spinosad, the, the organic um, uh, chemical, uh, is not labeled for use against apple maggot. He says it works, but I, you know, I, I am a WSU representative, so I can't recommend that. I'll bet you've all seen these probably in just huge piles in your house. And I am running late, and I'm going to try to finish up pretty quickly here. I'm actually almost at the end. Brown marmorated stink bug. They're everywhere, and they can damage your fruit, and this is what it looks like. And there's not a whole lot you can do about it because they've got this hard shell, and you can't spray them. But OSU has found a uh, uh, wasp. I think it's the samurai wasp they think is going to take care of it. It's a, it it'll kill the brown marmorated stink bug, and maybe it'll be gone. Again, western tent caterpillars, this is what the uh, egg ma mass looks like over winter. Go out and check your trees. You see anything like that, snip it off. Um, we probably won't have a problem with it this year. This is what frost damage looks like on a bud. You, If you think you've got frost damage, you may want to go out and take a few samples off. Cut the, the flower bud open, blossom bud open in half. And if you've got black stuff in there, that's that's a dead bud. You can pinch that off, and, and all you can do is hope for the best. But you really only need 10% of your flowers on the tree to pr produce a good crop. So that's a good thing. If you have a small tree, you can cover your tree when it's um, when it's you're expecting frost. I put these on here. I'm not going to go over them because you'll have access to them afterwards. But these are the different kinds of... Uh, stages that they're talking about when they're talking about um, bud burst. You see that? The little green bud is just starting. This is swollen bud. So this is what they look like, and I have them for apples, pears, and the, uh, the other fruits. I have a huge list of resources, but I wanted to show you this. If you decide to use um, a spray, WSU has some amazing schedules for you. If you have apple trees, and this is up to date. It tells you what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. Any cautions? And it's it's absolutely essential. If I were you, I would print these out and put them in in your twenty well, in your calendar, and then transfer to your twenty twenty two calendar when the time comes. It covers every fruit here, and it gives you all the information that you need. Um. We go back, and then I'm, I'm actually finished here, folks, so don't give up. Here's all the different things that different um, resources that you will find really, really helpful. If you have any questions, there are a couple ways of getting hold of us. Um, we're online. You can ask questions online, and we will get back to you. We have a phone number. We're not in the office right now because of COVID, um, so you can call us. But once we're open again, we'll be in the office, and our office is moving, folks. More, more, more news on that at a later date, but it won't be the place on the um, south side or the east side of the fairgrounds anymore. So I'm going to uh, open this up to questions and let you get folks get back to your evening.